I would like to welcome you to today's webinar, Significant Changes to the 2021 IBC Part 1. My name is Marcy Weaver and I'll be the education team moderator for today's presentation. Today's webinar is going to run one and one half hour. American Wood Council is a registered provider with the American Institute of Architects Continuing Education Systems. Please note that this webinar and associated slides should not be used as a substitute for competent engineering support and expertise. This course is copyrighted and not eligible for reproduction. And here's the team that is providing this course for you. Our speaker today is our very own Paul Armstrong. Our engineer moderator, engineering moderator is Director of Educational Outreach, Lori Cook. And behind the scenes is our education administrator, Kim Paulson, and myself, Manager of Education and Accreditation, Marcy Weaver. Now let's hand it over to Paul to talk about the changes in the 2021 IBC codes. Well, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, good night, I suppose, possibly. Uh, my name is Paul Armstrong. I am the Western Regional Manager for the American Wood Council. And uh, we are going to be talking about uh, significant changes, revisions really, to uh, that have occurred and show up in the 2021 International Building Code. A uh, little bit of my background, uh, just so you know, I am a, a professional engineer, certified building official, and many, many years ago, I started with the City of Los Angeles Department of Building and Safety, but I transitioned uh, over to uh, ICBO, one of the legacy code groups, and ICC, and I spent 14 years there in the code development department, uh, handling, working, facilitating, if you will, the code development activities uh, of the organizations, among other things. Uh, you can see some of the other uh, the other things that uh, I've been involved with, not the least of which uh, is the co-author of the 2013, 2016, 2019 California Building Code Significant Changes, uh, and uh, had a good time doing all that as well. So today we're going to start to uh, get through some of the changes here today. This is a compressed version. As you can see, uh, we are gonna go through the International Building Code, the 2021 edition. Now, with that being said, I have to give a shout out uh, to the International Code Council. I use their Significant Changes book for the IBC for this one and for the International Residential Code for a future uh, webinar as well. This particular document is probably one of the best documents, frankly, in my opinion, uh, that ICC has uh, put together because this includes not only the change, but certainly the change significance, which is developed from the reason statements uh, in the code development process that led to the acceptance of these items. And so then that's where the in-depth examination uh, comes in. We can talk about that. I highly recommend purchasing uh, those documents if you have an interest in uh, figuring out what's in front of you with the 2021 editions of the International Building and International Residential Code. Here are a couple of our objectives today. Uh, we are going to identify the differences between uh, the earlier edition, uh, the 2018 edition and the 2021. I will try to summarize uh, briefly as I can the change itself. And uh, what I like to do is try and focus on the impacts of these changes to various groups. Now, with that being said, you should know that the 2024 edition of the International Building Code is uh, in publication stage right now. Uh, staff at ICC is going through and uh, incorporating certainly the changes that resulted from uh, the last full cycle, uh, Group A and Group B, that incorporated uh, changes into the 2024 codes. Uh, those should come out at least in, in draft form if you're working on code changes. Uh, maybe by the fall, we might have uh, access to those, I'm hoping. But uh, if you do have any ideas that you would like incorporated into the code, and really that would result in uh, the 2027 edition of the International Building Code, please feel free to reach out. Our staff, uh, certainly our field staff in particular, 
are very experienced with uh, the code development process and we can at least give you some guidance as to how best to uh, submit those changes and to defend them and get them through the process. So feel free, reach out, and we would be happy to uh, assist in any way possible. Okay, with all that being said, we are going to step into uh, the code changes themselves. Uh, this one uh, has a definite uh, effect, certainly an impact on the American Wood Council. This is the first code change that we have here today that talks about the inclusion of what is called tall wood or mass timber into the building code now. Uh, there is a new type of or new types of construction or subtypes really that you can see listed here, type 4A, type 4B, and type 4C. This really is the first time we're going to have the opportunity to talk about it, but it won't be the last time. So this particular change in particular does talk about the inspection activities. This impacts certainly our inspectors and certainly those people who are constructing uh, mass timber buildings. This is one of the activities that our city uh, building inspectors or contract uh, building inspectors for various jurisdictions, city, county, state, that sort of thing, uh, have to, uh, to go through and make sure uh, is being looked at, reviewed, and approved ultimately. So uh, one of the big things about mass timber itself, since it is uh, mostly a pre-manufactured uh, off-site type of product, is the connection. The connection of those, uh, those panels, those elements and all that are critical. And so we wanna make sure that uh, the connections in this particular case, when there is a fire rating required, that uh, certainly the uh, connections are protected. Okay, uh, we wanna make sure that they are installed and really set up so that the protection will be there in the event of a fire. And so this is one of the activities that uh, has been developed for mass timber construction. We're gonna go through, as I said before, uh, and look at uh, a number of issues related to this, not the least of which certainly is how we can handle this and how we can understand a little bit more about mass timber in our jurisdictions and certainly in our practices. We've made a jump uh, from chapter one to chapter two. Uh, as I said earlier, uh, this is a compressed presentation. Uh, ICC and others have full day presentations on these significant changes. So frankly, what we're doing is we are talking about those changes that I feel are much more significant than others. There are significant code changes. I get that uh, in this particular cycle, but you know, if you have a question on any of them, you can feel free to reach out to your field staff here or to ICC staff, certainly, uh, about those. And uh, those would be covered mostly in their uh, books on the significant changes for the IBC and the IRC. The definition of atrium has been simplified. One thing you're gonna find about code changes that go through the ICC code development process is there are a lot of code changes that are intending to simplify the application, uh, the use of, the enforcement of the code uh, for a given topic. In this case, this certainly does that. Uh, the definition of atrium has been uh, something that over the years has been a challenge to deal with from time to time. Uh, one of the activities that I used to, to cover for ICBO and ICC were uh, the interpretations of the code itself. And so we did get a number of questions related to what is uh, actually an atrium versus just an opening in the floor. Well, this is about as clear as you're going to get. When you have, just as a general rule, if you want to look at it the way the code is supposed to be set up, uh, when you have three or more stories that are connected vertically, by a shaft or some sort of opening through the floor, then we call that an atrium and we apply the atrium criteria that's found in chapter four to that particular situation. Now, uh, really what should be an exception perhaps uh, is that when we have some institutional uses and you can see group I and uh, I2 and I3, 
we are going to be more conservative. So if you are connecting two or more stories, in other words, if you have an opening in one floor in an I-2 or I-3, let's say it's an I-3 jail or whatever, we're going to call that an atrium and apply the, the protection criteria uh, in that particular case. Those particular uses, the occupants uh, that are there residing in those uses uh, have difficulty uh, in one form or another, we'll put it that way, of actually using the complete means of egress system to get to the public way. And as a result, we're going to provide more protection for those occupants. Okay, jails you can figure out, or those places where people are restrained, you can figure out you know, why we do not want them to reach the public way uh, by law. So we're going to provide them with an extra level of protection in those cases so that they are uh, safe from any sort of uh, adverse effects of fire in particular, if that should occur uh, in that particular use. But know that in the code development process, we have a lot of activity looking at these various areas within the code that need more clarification based on the questions that are received, based on certainly the difficulties of construction. And uh, that is by far and away the, the largest, if you will, volume of code changes that we actually see in the code development process. And certainly that's the largest volume of those that are approved by the ICC membership. Change of occupancy. Here's another one that has been a challenge. Uh, over the years, and if you will, in my opinion, continues to be a challenge based on the wording. We'll get into that here. So change of occupancy, we're dealing with existing buildings, right? So you can see in item one, the occupancy classification changes from one class, uh, if you will, maybe from group B to group A, perhaps, or uh, maybe uh, from uh, A2 to A3 or vice versa or something along those lines, the classification of that particular area of the building or structure or the whole building itself has changed. Now we go to uh, item number two. And item number two, uh, frankly, I, I'm not entirely sure has made it that much better for us. Uh, in some ways, perhaps, made it a little more difficult. This now says that the change of occupancy is any change in the purpose of, we're gonna split up this particular sentence a little bit, the purpose of a building or structure, okay? That really relates to activities within, that relates to perhaps other types of issues that are more closely related to occupancy classification changes. Okay, we understand that. The purpose of the building has changed. Now, let's go to the second phrase that is offset by commas there. It says, any change in the level of activity within a building or structure. What does that mean? Well, that's actually a really good question. Uh, previously, we had you know some vague terminology that we used uh, that um, did cause us to apply the criteria appropriately to the, the particular project. But in this case, a change in the level of activity. So if you have, let's just use a, a small cafe. If you have a cafe and because of the occupant load or because of the area of that cafe, it is actually classified as a group B occupancy. So if the owner wants to expand the seating area a little bit, okay, they're gonna keep it under, if you will, the occupant load of 49, they say it's 40 now, it's going from 30 to 40. Is that a change in the level of activity? It's a good question. Technically, I think that it is. I don't know that I would necessarily, and I've been a building official for a number of jurisdictions, mostly here in Southern California, but I don't think that I would apply the change of occupancy criteria, if you will, in that particular case, right? 
The level of activity is not a defined term. We don't know exactly what that is. Unfortunately, the, uh, the wording that is found in the significant changes doesn't really help us with that. So we're gonna have to take a look at that moving forward to see exactly how this impacts the projects that are going through uh, design, that are going through various cities for permitting, plan review and permitting. Uh, that or that are being constructed. Uh, there are a lot of areas where uh, or times when the level of activity does change. And the thing is, change goes both ways. So if you have a cafe and that cafe wants to go to takeout only, does that mean we have to apply a lot of the new code criteria to this particular tenant improvement? Not sure that I would do that, but we have that in the code now. Take a look at this. What I always say is certainly when you are a building official or you're in that particular role as a plan reviewer or inspector, that you, you make a determination and you try to be as consistent as possible moving forward with that particular interpretation from then on. That's the key is that people want consistency. They want to know what to expect if they are building in your jurisdiction, should you happen to be a building official or city staffer or contract staff for that uh, jurisdiction. So watch out for this one. It was a sneaky little one. Uh, I do participate in the code development process still, as do a lot of our field staff with the American Wood Council. And we take a look at a lot of these things because frankly, a number of us have had enforcement and design experience in going through and using and applying the code. And we try to get this so that uh, even though it might be outside of the, the wood kinds of areas, uh, we try and help out as much as possible when we're doing this. So again, take a look at this. If you have any uh, ideas as to how to make this better, let me know. I would love to run this up the flagpole to the various groups that are out there developing code changes, frankly, right now for the 2027 editions of the codes. This is a good one. This one has been coming around for some time. Um, windborne debris regions, as I mentioned earlier, I'm here in Southern California. We don't have a, a lot of this. We do have some. But uh, periodically, uh, you know, we'll have high winds or areas where the winds speed up as uh, you know, challenges for the built environment. But certainly when you're in those areas where you do have hurricanes, maybe tornadoes, things along those lines, uh, that we need to be able to protect uh, certainly uh, the exterior envelope as much as possible. This particular definition is specifically addressing the protective elements that go over or cover or protect in some way glazing uh, windows, things of that nature, okay? It does not really address the protection of, you know, the wall assemblies, but it does get into those systems that are uh, designed, developed to provide that kind of protection because we know that when the winds do speed up to those levels where it's picking up debris of all kinds, right, uh, that that will have, uh, a, a, a problem for the structures that are out there, existing buildings, right? Uh, because they will penetrate certainly through windows, maybe doors too, but windows in particular. And uh, the industry has developed a standard, it's ASTM E1996, as I recall. And that's been going on for some time, trying to address how we protect the built environment, the potential for the exterior envelope to be penetrated and then all of a sudden to lose the protection that is provided by it based on, you know, whatever is flying around, okay? Way back in the day, they started off with just a very simple air compressed type of a, for lack of a better term, cannon that would shoot a two by four. They've taken that and they've, they've formalized it quite a bit and they've made it actually now a code requirement, which this definition refers to. So for those of you that live in those areas that are subject to windborne debris, 
we now know that we're getting more protective criteria in that will help to serve, certainly, uh, the protection of the occupants and, and the built environment in your regions. So um, I'm very happy to see this. It's been a long time coming. Uh, I've been in this business for over 30 years of just code development. And it's been something that has been a big topic over the years. Okay, as I said, with our very first code change, uh, mass timber, tall wood, is it frankly is one of the biggest construction material changes in years. Uh, as long as I can remember, uh, it has caused uh, a change in all sorts of areas of the code that we're going to talk about. We can't talk about all of them. However, not today, but they will show up in the Significant Changes book if you're interested. And certainly, the American Wood Council has um, documents that can be used to help you understand the application of the criteria to these projects. These projects, these, these mass timber projects, are made up of very large, typically built up panelized or engineered types of wood elements, okay? They do meet the cross-section dimensions of what we used to call type four heavy timber. It is type four heavy timber now, but that, that particular uh, classification or the type of construction classifications have changed a bit. We're gonna talk about that today. These are uh, fabricated typically offsite in a factory somewhere and then hauled to a site and erected into place. Uh, there, is, there are a lot of projects that are going on right now related to mass timber, some very interesting projects too. Uh, and it's not just complete mass timber projects. We're not just seeing projects built completely out of what's called cross laminated timber as one element of mass timber, but we're seeing what are called hybrid types of systems that are being uh, designed, developed, utilized uh, to create the structures that are desired on the part of the owner and certainly the design team. So we'll go through some of that. We do need to understand that uh, because we have this, this term mass timber and it does say specifically type four construction, uh, you can have mass timber used in type five construction you can have mass timber used in type three construction. So just know that there is a, an allowance for that in other types of construction. The big change that we have, however, is certainly the increase in area, increase in height we're gonna talk about for these types of buildings. Now there's a second definition. It's talking about non-combustible protection for mass timber. Well, you look at the first definition of mass timber, you think, well, these are, it's just all wood. Well, certainly uh, we have to provide a certain amount of fire protection for these elements. And part of that is non-combustible material, right? If you are in the highest form of the mass timber type of construction, type 4A, there is a significant fire resistance rating that is applied to that. And so it's not just the cross laminated timber, which is called CLT, just so you know, and I'll use that abbreviation throughout this particular webinar, but it's, it includes this non-combustible fire resistive material, whether it is the sheet steel, but typically it's gonna be gypsum wallboard and it's gonna be built up, uh, that kind of a thing that will be designed to add to, if you will, the fire resistance of these elements itself, okay? Uh, there are other mass timber uh, presentations that are out there that do uh, talk about the fire testing in particular that uh, the mass timber elements have gone through, which it, it was very rigorous what they were put through, right? However, in developing this, and we'll get into a little bit more about the development of the mass timber criteria here in just a bit. But in developing this particular set of criteria, they felt that since this is new, they did not feel like there was a lot of experience with this kind of a product that they actually added to the fire resistance rating of these wood elements themselves. So 
we have this now in a definition too that we could fall back to to help us understand this really new form of construction. So here we are with the cross laminated timber. Here's a CLT. I really like this picture here on the left. Uh, it really does indicate to me how these panels are put together. Okay, the 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 the, the diagram on the right uh, does show that these can be very tall buildings. We'll get into that in a bit. But this particular product, CLT, is very much, if you will, like a plywood product, only it's using two by, if you will, veneer layers, two by, two inch by, if you will, layers to create these panelized structures, these are these panelized elements. These elements are created in factories. You can see, at least in the background a bit, that there is some sort of a, um, a building behind it. It is not the building that this, these are being applied to. These are being shipped to a site and then ultimately hoisted into place and then connected and creating a new mass timber building. So this is one of my, like I said, it's one of my favorite photographs because it really does give us uh, a good idea about these, the, the construction of, if you will, the fabrication of these panels. Okay, and we're gonna talk about mass timber uh, much more coming up. We've got a good section uh, in this presentation on that. We're still in chapter two. Uh, there has been uh, an area here with the definition of penthouse that has always kind of been a problem for us. When you get into taller buildings, there is a requirement that at least one stairway extend to the roof. Uh, reason for that is, you know, for maintenance, that kind of a thing for the various uh, appliances, perhaps that are up there among other things. But it never did specifically say that stairway enclosures were an allowed projection above the roof height. A penthouse, by definition is an allowable projection above the, the measured height of the building. So technically some people were looking at this and saying, nope, the height of the building is measured to the top of the stairway enclosure. Okay, I mean, so long as you're consistent, I suppose that's all right. Um, there was another phrase that allows for the protection of vertical openings or something to, to that nature. I always threw the stairway enclosure into that, like you would have perhaps with a elevator enclosure uh, or other type of enclosure uh, above the roof. But anyway, they clarified it. I think this is a very good one. This is a clarification in my mind uh, because it's making it very clear that we can't allow for these uh, stairways to be properly protected from the environment and to not adversely impact certainly the design of the, the, the building itself, certainly when they're getting up to uh, the, the limits that you find in chapter five for the height of buildings, this will make it much better for those particular projects. Okay, we've moved into chapter three. Chapter three is our occupancy classification chapter. Hopefully you know that. Um, we have a, a number of different uses that pop up uh, all the time. It seems like there's always somebody coming up with something new and we have to figure out, okay, what occupancy classification are we going to put these in? And really that is the job of the local building official, sometimes fire official, depending on where you're located, uh, to make that determination. Now we have what I consider to be a relatively new uh, use, these energy storage systems. They've been around for a number of years, I get it. It's just that my mind frame goes back to the 1927 Uniform Building Code, uh, which I used to have a, an original copy of, but I've, I've donated to a kind of a, a moving library that's out there. These energy storage systems do have particular hazards associated with them. All right, and we're still going through uh, how to protect the built environment and certainly occupants from those hazards. We understand that. We see a lot of work that's going on related to these energy storage systems all over the country, okay? But when these are in their own building, 
okay, dedicated use building, what occupancy are we going to assign? Well, these do have a hazard associated with them. When you use that, that term, the group H classification comes to mind sometimes for at least some people. I know it did uh, when I first started hearing about these, just as a, if you will, a knee jerk reaction. But in going through the ICC code development process, the ICC membership agreed that a group F1, a moderate hazard factory classification should be applied in these cases. And I agree with that, I, I really do. I mean, normally these are not really heavily occupied uh, types of buildings. They're nominally occupied, if that, right? So you go through and it's like, okay, F1 works for me. And it gives certainly a good amount of flexibility for the industry, the energy storage system industry in designing these buildings and putting uh, these storage systems into uh, use. Now, the other one is, is a funny one to me because I, uh, like I said, at the beginning of all this, I started out in the building safety world with the city of LA. The city of LA has its own uh, certainly water and sewer treatment facilities. And we did see projects uh, from a very large sewer treatment facility. And, and honestly, we didn't know what classification to put those into. Again, you only had employees. You didn't have as many employees with those once they're up and operational. Uh, so the, the occupant load is very, very light. Uh, the hazards associated with them are nominal. I don't know that I've seen too much trouble from a fire perspective related to those. So they, the ICC membership has decided that a group F1 classification is appropriate in these cases. So we have two new uh, occupancy classifications and there are going to be more as we go out and the laundry list, if you will, that occurs within chapter three under each of these occupancy classifications seems to be increasing every cycle. So here we have a couple more. I think this really does help the industry, however, especially in terms of the ES, ESS types of activities that are out there. This is a good one. We have also had an increase in the craft sorts of distilling and brewing areas. So we, we had to determine what are we gonna do with these particular uses that are popping up. Although I've seen them kind of slow down a bit. We have a friend that has his own brewery and whatnot, and some of the activities related to that uh, kind of have slowed down. But, uh, <laughs> and you can see that I forgot to change from the California uh, version to the international uh, version in this slide. The CFC is a California fire code. Well, it should read international fire code in both cases, but we know because this uses alcohol or it creates alcohol, alcohol can be a fire hazard, right? And so we have to do something with these. And so this is one of the cases when the ICC membership, and we already had a, a, a if you will, a laundry list of what is not a hazardous occupancy, but they've added two new ones to the list. Distilling or brewing in, brewing in accordance with the fire code or the storage of beer, distilled spirits and wines in barrels and casks in accordance with the fire code. Okay, those are not group H occupancies. We get that, all right? But this is a, a point apparently where the ICC membership and whoever submitted this particular code change, I can't remember right now off the top of my head, but uh, they decided that we needed to uh, say what it is not as opposed to what it is. So in terms of what it is, we're going to start to look at some other occupancy classifications. And for the storage of these, these particular beverages, we now have uh, its own classification. So anything over 16% of uh, alcohol content, okay, we're going to say it's a moderate hazard, a group S1 occupancy. And then anything below 16%, which are typically your beers and most wines, we're going to be group S2 or low hazard. So it really, to me, 
the 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 nice part about this particular code change is that uh, we've made a delineation between the higher alcohol content uh, drinks, uh, beverages, mixers, whatever, and those that are uh, not as high. And so we have that classification going on here. I think this is very helpful out there because we do still see uh, you know different breweries popping up uh, and growing based on you know how well their their craft brand is doing. And we need to do something with those when we get into these kinds of uh, projects. So it's a very good code change to help us delineate, frankly, between beer and wine and distilled spirits. All right, we've moved out of chapter three. We are going to go through uh, as much of the building code as we can today. This is part one, just FYI. We're going to try and get up to uh, certainly chapter 10, uh, which is means of egress, and then we'll take uh, questions after that. Right. So we're in chapter four. Smoke control has been uh, an area that has seen a lot of research, a lot of work over the years. I remember back in the 1994 edition of the Uniform Building Code when the first real smoke control analysis methods uh, got into the codes and how they've changed since then. And so uh, we now have an exception for smoke control systems and atriums. When you had previously, the existing exception was if you're connecting one, you know, two stories with one opening, okay, you did not have to add a smoke control system. Anything above that needed a smoke control system, right? Or some of us would see, you know, in some of these other buildings, fire protection engineering reports showing why or why not smoke control system should be installed uh, in a given project specific to that project. Well, in this case, there's been a new exception that says that atriums can actually connect through or pass through more than two stories so long as they comply with the following. Only the bottom two stories are open to the atrium. All of the stories above are basically, as it says, separated, but they're within a shaft enclosure. You have a highly uh, rated fire barriers that are providing protection to the occupants on those upper floors from certainly the, the issues related to fire and combustion and smoke uh, that could occur in an atrium. So in effect, what we're doing with this particular code change is we're taking those floor assemblies that are horizontal and moving them vertical as they move up through the building. It does allow for uh, certainly the atrium uh, design to occur without having to add certainly a very expensive smoke control system uh, in those environments. Uh, the protection is there, at least it was felt to be equivalent there because not only do we have the assemblies being protected, but all openings, all penetrations and the like have that kind of penetration assigned to it. It's a good code change. It's one where we're allowing a little more flexibility in the codes for these design scenarios. And the, the separation is only between the atrium and the occupied space in those upper stories. So if they have exterior walls, they could be all, if you will, glass cladding types of systems. So that it creates the atrium effect that they're looking for. And it gives certainly all of us the uh, a better feeling for the protection that's being provided for the occupants. So another nice code change uh, that ICC has uh, adopted into the 2021 code. This is this is a funny one. The exception that allowed for basically level floors of Group S2 parking garages now has been deleted. So we have to have sloping floors to the drainage system and all that based on the potential for uh, liquids of various types, whether it's gasoline or perhaps uh, there's a problem and there's a lot of water that's poured into an area and you can control that, okay? Uh, there can be other types of liquids too that can be spilled onto floors and we need to provide them with the means 
of having that liquid by gravity make its way to the uh, the drainage system that's provided. Now, this was, if I remember correctly, removed from the 2009 edition of the IBC or allowed for flat floors in the IBC. So prior to that, we had sloped floors in these areas. 2009 comes along, they say you don't need to have that because you know we're controlling the uh, the weather, we're controlling other elements or other issues, and we don't need to provide for this this gravity type of flow for these parking garage floors. Well, guess what? 2020, 2021 edition of the IBC comes along, and now we have this back. Okay. One of the challenges I think is, is we could have some issues with additions to or even alterations perhaps of uh, parking garages, okay, that were built when that exception was in place. And how do you marry the two together? Well, that's gonna be a really good question. Uh, the existing building code doesn't really address uh, this kind of issue, but we're gonna have to deal with it somehow and we're gonna have to come up with a means of making sure that certainly any liquids, gasoline or others that are spilled in these areas do have an opportunity to uh, be removed uh, by gravity, the sloping of the floors. So we have that in front of us. This just shows us that sometimes you think you've got a great idea, and then a few years later you go, nope, we're gonna change it back. And that's what they've done in this particular case. I2 corridor doors, okay, this really is for non-fire rated corridors. When you have the allowance or uh, no, if you will, fire resistance rating of corridor walls, ceilings too perhaps, but corridor walls is what we're talking about. Okay, you still have the concern for the control of the smoke. So the fire rating isn't there, but we wanna make sure that it's tight. So in effect, uh, even though and this says two conditions, really it's one and two are together and three is the separate condition more than anything else. We have the ability now to require, if you will, these more smoke tight types of doors when we have no rating required for these corridor walls or for the door itself, okay? The doors, uh, solid doors have to have close fitting operational tolerances, in other words, in, they need to have a means of controlling the smoke. I don't know that I've ever seen an I2 settings Dutch style door. Some of you may have, that's great. Uh, just in my practice over the years, I, I just haven't seen it. Uh, the idea is that uh, obviously Dutch doors are, uh, you have an upper leaf and a lower leaf. Uh, the idea is that they can be connected together and that each leaf, uh, has its own latching hardware, that kind of a thing. Uh, we're still providing uh, the protection that we need, that we want uh, from smoke in those cases, because then the door acts as one, either through an astragal or some sort of type of situation. It's called out in the code itself. Uh, when there is makeup air required, however, you can have a gap at the bottom of the door. This is really one of the, the other conditions that allows for the makeup air to be uh, utilized and still give us a reasonable amount of protection from the level uh, the smoke layers that occur from the top and fill up from the top down. So this is at the bottom of the door, of course. And we wanna make sure that again, that it is, it's a nominal two thirds of an inch gap, it, which is actually kind of a, a strange uh, dimension for us, but that's what was called out. So we have that now in these I2 settings. We want to make sure that we're providing the proper level of protection, in this case, from the, the hazards due to smoke. Automatic closing doors in these same uh, occupancies. When you have doors on you know, magnetic hold opens or they're automatic closers of various types, we want to make sure that uh, they, they call it out very clearly that uh, either the fire alarm system or the, the sprinkler system when it actuates will cause the automatic closing devices to allow the doors to close uh, or both of those systems, okay? And that when that 
even just one door is triggered in a smoke compartment, all the doors in a smoke compartment are triggered and closed at that point. Again, we want to make sure that the protection is provided for the occupants in these cases, because frankly, they cannot egress out necessarily uh, very easily on their own. And because of that, we're going to provide them with a little higher level of protection. We're going to give a little more care in the design, if you will, for these, these particular designs and projects. And it gives us a chance to uh, feel comfortable with that design too. Okay, Th this has been a, a very interesting uh, topic over the years. I've got projects that I remember, code enforcement projects, if you know what that means that uh, you know, somebody found these, these people who are putting escape rooms in, they're now called puzzle rooms. We actually have a definition of puzzle room now in the code. We didn't talk about it today, but it is in uh, new to the 2021 code. Okay, we understand now what is involved with these. Okay, that the idea is that a group, a person or a group of people, I suppose, could be a single person, I guess, goes into a space and needs to solve some sort of, as, as it indicates, puzzle, riddle, some sort of challenge to actually either get to the next space or, or get out. Now, initially, back in the day, and it was, like I said, it was a code enforcement uh, activity, they actually locked people in rooms. Okay, and they had to solve their way out of that room. Well. It, the ones that I've seen mostly today, it's more like you go into a space and you can uh, get out. And this particular uh, code change does embody that, uh, whether you solve the puzzle or not, right? So when designing these particular puzzle rooms, okay, the exiting has to uh, be in accordance with chapter 10 or an alternate design approved by the fire code official. Now, in some ways, this is a, a very common sense, no brainer sort of a statement, okay? We understand chapter 10 applies to all uses, all buildings everywhere, right? And then alternates we can always do, but they wanted to make sure that this was clearly called out and that we get to the third condition where all the exits are open, readily available upon, again, like we had in the previous slide, activation of some sort of fire alarm, sprinkler, or, or whatever, maybe a switch or button at a constantly attended location. Challenge I have with this last part is that manual control at a constantly attended location. Um, what I've seen is that, you know, the people there, while they're trained in the business of puzzle room activities, they're not always trained uh, to stay in a, a given room or to have somebody assigned to some sort of control room, right? And go through and in the event of an emergency, hit the button, open the doors, whatever, so that people can get out. All right, that's one of the challenges I have with that. And there's no way to enforce a constantly attended location. You can't be there all the time to make sure that's gonna happen. However, it's in the code. And so we have that now, we have an ability to look at these types of um, businesses really these puzzle rooms and get hopefully the designs that will keep people safe in using them this one has been a fun one over the years too um, by the way i find all code changes interesting i find most code changes fun so i, I may be using those terms quite a bit uh, it's just that i've been doing this for over 30 years and it's very interesting to see how these progress i remember when children's play structures came into the code you know, we had fast food restaurants that wanted to provide these climbing structures or ball pits or whatever, you know, within the building for the children to use while they're, you know, enjoying whatever fast food uh, is being served there. Okay, well, this has changed a bit. We now have the ability to look at not just children's structures, but those structures that presumably adults may be using. Okay, the area that can be, uh, if you will, occupied by these with little regulation has doubled now to 600 square feet. So it was 300 square feet, 
now it's 600 square feet, right? So that's that's getting a little bit bigger. Presumably we're talking about not just the the little plastic tubes and the ball pits and the little hanging foam things. We're talking about potentially looking at uh, climbing gyms and things of that nature. So when we get to uh, the larger facilities, the interior finish requirements are kicked in. And so we need to make sure, and of course, you know, we have a picture here of an outdoor playground, which, you know, requires a permit. You know, some cities, their public works or parks do things on their own. I get that. But uh, we're looking at mostly interior settings with this particular uh, code change itself. And we want to make sure that uh, the plastics, the materials that are really being used, the foam, et cetera, for these particular structures do have a characteristic of resisting, if you will, or limiting the amount of smoke and fire, and et cetera, a fire spread that can occur if there is a fire in those areas. Okay, so we need to see that these are, if you will, uh, tested, listed types of products that will uh, keep us safe in the event of emergency. Now, with that being said, going back to the children's play structures and certainly the hard plastic tubes and all that, I remember discussions because a lot of these, these facilities are required to have automatic fire sprinklers installed. Uh, there were uh, quite a few people that were starting to say, okay, how are we going to protect the inside of these plastic tubes? right inside of these play structures. Well, they're shielded from the building's uh, fire sprinkler system. How are we going to do that? And some people actually, I couldn't believe they said this exactly, but they actually wanted to have sprinkler heads project down into these tubes themselves so that if there were a fire inside the tube that they would actuate and whatnot. But it was found to be more of a hazard from uh, a striking standpoint or accidental discharge standpoint with kids playing with the sprinkler heads themselves and maybe causing them to actuate uh, without having a fire and all that. But there's been a lot of discussion uh, related to this over the years, and it's very interesting to see how this has progressed. Occupied roofs, boy, there's been a lot of work with this. This has become a much more popular thing. We've had this for years. I mean, you see a lot of movies where, you know, people go up onto the roof and you know, there's music and they're watching, you know, the, the city or whatever. Uh, from the roof itself, where well, we're actually recognizing and have uh, in the last couple of codes, these particular situations. Okay, we have now clarified that the occupied roof itself does not actually add to or included in the allowable area of the building uh, or the building height so long as they are open right? They have no enclosures up there. We can have penthouses. We talked about stairway enclosures before, right? We talked about that. Okay, so that is an allowable projection up there. But if somebody, a hotel, perhaps wants to have a pool or a setting out there on the roof, a, a little deck area, they cannot have a, a bar, uh, bathrooms, uh, and all of that up there because those actually do increase the height. They increase the allowable area potentially of the building itself. And it's a real challenge in dealing with existing buildings when you get that kind of proposal. So watch out for that. And there's a new exception that says that if there is an emergency voice alarm system, alarm communication system that is in the building, for other reasons that that needs to be extended up to the occupied roof area. So if all of the other occupants within the building have this, this system that can tell them to frankly get out of the building now, it's, un, you know, it's in fire or whatever, you're gonna have to extend that up to that occupied roof. And again, challenges with existing buildings when that occurs. The allowable area frontage increase has been simplified dramatically. Uh, there is now just a very simple, actually there's two tables technically, that eliminates the equation. Being an engineer, I like the equation. It did present some interesting situations if you do not have uh, a rectangular simple lot and all of that. The table does solve some of the challenges, but th there are some issues related to it yet. They're still working on that. 
and the the second table applies when you have these these buildings that can be unlimited area but do not have 60 foot yards uh, all the way around and so it builds in the the, the allowable frontage uh, based on that too so we have that now again trying to simplify make the code easier to use the uh, the previous equation while it was i think it was very powerful in some ways uh it was very complicated however as a result uh it confused people more than anything else and so they have a table now it gives you simple values and there's a footnote uh, at the bottom of the table that allows you to interpolate between the values uh, it doesn't tell you how to interpolate exactly but we can figure that out uh, on our own. Stairways and podium buildings. This has been an interesting podium construction is still uh, kind of the rage, uh, certainly for large residential types of projects or mixed use projects. We have a type one parking garage, maybe there's some uses below the podium deck, but on top of it, you might have type three, four or five construction, uh, usually residential uh, or, you know, again, mixed use and all of that. There was always a concern about the stairways that serve both above and below the podium itself. Uh, once it is below the podium, we're getting into the type one criteria. Does that stairway then need to be of the same type of construction? In other words, non-combustible. In this case, it gives you two conditions. Now, the first condition is, again, kind of a no-brainer. Uh, these are the non-combustible forms of construction, if you will a type three, four or five, but the stairway itself is bounded by, it's enclosed by three hour uh, fire barriers, basically, even though it doesn't say that specifically, uh, it's three hour shaft walls that gives us the protection there. We can uh, have these stairways be of combustible construction if they desire. Now, normally I don't see that. I see a lot of uh, prefabricated steel or other types of uh, stairways being uh, installed, but you could have combustible stairway con construction project down below that podium deck now. Okay, we're gonna get into certainly our type uh, four construction. This is mass timber or tall wood. Uh, there was really very little uh, change related to the existing criteria for heavy timber, except that we did designate it just like that type four HT, heavy timber. Uh, we have the, the three new, if you will, subclassifications, type four A, type four B, type four C. ICC did have an ad hoc committee that went through and developed all of this. And they went and uh, showed uh, through their research, a comparison, if you will, with other kinds of structures uh, there wasn't a lot of study done. There is no way to do a study on the allowable heights and areas, types of construction, things along those lines, because the existing criteria has no real uh, research backup into it. It was all good rule of thumb back in the day. And so we had, they, we had to create a comparatively safe type of situation. So the first table we're gonna look at here is table 601 for types of construction. We have, uh, you can see in the uh, oval there, there's our type four A, B, and C. Uh, you can already tell uh, the comparison that was done uh, by the highlighting that was done. They needed to come up with a means of comparing and contrasting these new types of construction with what we had existing. In other words, to make it fit within the system. And so that's what they did. And you can see that type four A, highlighted in yellow, is in this case, for this particular table, considered to be uh, protected the same way as type 1A, which is our highest form of construction. It gives you the unlimited area, it gives you unlimited height. You'll see that type 4A doesn't get that, uh, but it, we have the same level of protection, okay? And then certainly we would go and we'd say, okay, type 4B, you know, what are we gonna compare that to? And type 4C, they just said, look, we're just gonna make it equivalent to type 1B. So if you compare and contrast, certainly the simple values, uh, some of the footnotes may be a little bit different, but just from the general rule, that's what we have. There are highly rated structural elements that we have created in the type 4A, B, and C form of construction. 
And uh, we're getting certainly a, a level of safety that we feel uh, is very, very, uh, comparatively speaking, very, very safe for uh, the occupants that are served by it. So here's a comparison. Again, biggest construction material change in years. It's caused quite a stir actually out there. And it is seen uh, a lot of projects that are popping up. If you go to a uh, woodworks.org uh, site, you can look at uh, all the projects that are either built or in process right now. Uh, here's, this is a group B business office type of a setting. Uh, actually, we jumped the gun just a little bit with this particular slide because we're actually showing the height and area, but you can see the differences between the different types of construction, okay? Very, very interesting to go through this and compare and contrast against what we've had in the past and what we're seeing now moving on into the future. Here we are looking at the allowable height and number of feet. They had to go through and do the same kind of comparison with uh, this particular table as we did with the type of construction. Now, if you remember carefully, uh, type 4A was considered to be, comparatively speaking, the same in terms of protection uh, as type 1A. However, if you look at type 1A for sprinkler business, you can see that then that top box up there, uh, the red outline box, we've got uh, type 1B, it says 180 feet. Type 1A is unlimited. Well, they didn't feel comfortable in going with unlimited height. Okay, so if you move over to type 4A, they did 270. Well, that's interesting. There is no 270 feet anywhere in that table, certainly that's shown here, other than in the new types of construction, type 4A. So what they did is they said, well, we're going to, we're going to allow type 4B to be similar to type 1B and then give a 50% increase to type 4A. Okay, so 180 times 1.5, if you will, is 270. That's the simple math. Okay, we get that. All right, so they're, they're again trying to figure out how these new type 4 uh, types of construction fit within the current system. So we have another new one called type 4C. Okay, so what are we going to do with that? Well, for the most part, it is the same as type 4 heavy timber that we had before. We're under the same limitations that we had for the existing type 4 construction. So you can see, at least in this part of the table, that we were able to show that we have that comparison going on. So moving on, we get into allowable number of stories. A uh, different table, obviously, similar kind of situation. So if we go, and I like to use Group B because we see a lot of office buildings. Uh, we could use R2, I suppose, but uh, for the most part, B is a little simpler to use. But uh, type 4A, okay, if you follow the column down to B sprinklered, most R sprinklered, allows for 18 stories. It's like 18 stories doesn't show up anywhere in this table. Well, you can already see the equations down below. They went and compared type 4B to type 1B and then added a 50% increase for type 4A again. So the allowable height has that 50% increase over what we had for type 1B for type 4A. Okay, very, very interesting to see that. You can compare and contrast. Now, type 4C all over the place. There's very little consistency. I'm trying to figure out and maybe some of the people who are involved with uh, the development of this particular table will, will be able to tell me why certain uh, uses have uh, the same requirement or they have you know a little different way of looking at it because if you get into uh, certainly R1 uh, sprinkler with area increase, okay, you follow across the type 4C, it says seven stories in heavy timber, it's four stories. Well, you go up to type to group B, type 4C, it's nine stories. Heavy timber is six stories, that's half again. Well, it doesn't quite work out. It, it could be that they were trying to use the same sort of methodology, but they rounded up, perhaps. Uh, in doing so. And that's the only thing that I can find. I just haven't found anybody that would admit, admit to that yet.
So there you have it for allowable height. And then of course, our last uh, big table here, allowable areas. This is a biggie, okay? So if you look at, again, let's go to group B for type 1A and type 1B. Uh, you can look at any of the, the allowances there. They're both unlimited in area. Whether it's sprinklered or not, multi-story or not, doesn't matter. Well, the Tallwood Ad Hoc Committee didn't feel comfortable in going with unlimited uh, area for any of the type four, uh, the new type four construction. So they had to do something. So what they did is they went back to the heavy timber values. You can see the equation down below. Uh, type 4A is three times the heavy timber value. Type 4B is two times. And Type 4C is basically 25% more, 25% increase. Now, there are exceptions. I get it. Uh, one thing that you're going to find is that when you get into that, you, you start to look at some of the non sprinkler uh, uh, types of situations. And while they still do that, there's some variances there. Uh, but uh, for the most part, the equations that we have down below filled in the gaps uh, and filled in the table for us to allow for the type four A, B, and C to fit into our current code situation. So very interesting. They, they did a ton of work uh, to come up with all of this and certainly through the code development process there was a lot more work that was done and and uh, industry groups got involved and participated uh, some more vigorously than others and ultimately we ended up with just this so the last table we have is our fire separation distance table we had to add that in the very simply they added type 4a equivalent to type 1a uh, for the five foot up to uh, up to 10 foot, you can see that. And then down below from the 10 foot up to 30, they added A and B. Type 4C is assumed to fall into the other category. So we have that criteria filled out there for us and we're in good shape. We've got it all covered uh, in all areas of the code. They really did an excellent job in putting together this package that went in front of the ICC membership. Okay. That's not all uh, for mass timber, certainly, but uh, we will be talking uh, a little bit more, certainly in this uh, part, but in the second part too, about mass timber applications in the code as well, because we do have uh, some areas that are of concern and they, they address them. So we got those all handled. Uh, moving on into chapter seven. We had a provision that talked about fire protection, if you will, of joints and the joint systems that were developed and all that. Well, they've included that to address voids. Now, I considered the voids to be joints, but anyway, they wanted to be clear. And you can see in the second line of that top bullet uh, that it says, clarify the application to voids too. That's exactly what they did. A void is, the intersection of a horizontal floor assembly with maybe an exterior cladding system where you don't actually have the, the floor system ends and the exterior cladding system is applied to the outside of the building. Well, they want to make sure that 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 opening, if you will, that void does not allow for the passage of smoke or other products of combustion to upper floors or I suppose lower lower floors, too. But typically the physics of fire causes them to move upward. And so we want to make sure that those are protected too, and they're installed based on certainly their testing and listing of that particular product. We get that. They're just addressing this particular case much more specifically now. Terminated stop uh, prohibition. Okay, very interesting. I, I had never heard of this particular concern per se, but in some uses, door stops. Uh, to keep the door, to help to keep the door in place, actually do not extend all the way down to the floor system. They do that because they need to uh, be very careful in their cleaning of these. These can come in institutional uses and they don't want uh, any sort of bacteria or other types of disease or whatever to accumulate uh, in these areas. And so uh, they would stop, the stop in the frame about just a couple of inches above the floor level. Well, 
we now have to make sure that we're providing the protection there, that we have either the stops projecting all the way down or continuing all the way down the floor to provide a complete seal in the door uh, and all of that, uh, or that there is some sort of ability to withstand the penetration of perhaps smoke and other types of situations. These are specific to smoke and draft control assemblies. We want to make sure, again, that we're controlling the products of combustion in a, a safe and sane, if you will, uh, manner. Fire protective curtain assemblies now has new criteria in the code. They don't have to go out and get evaluation reports or other types of listings like an evaluation report. They, they do have listings themselves. The curtains themselves are labeled and you have to install them per NFPA 80, which has criteria for these particular curtain-like fabric, if you will, uh, assemblies. We've had these for a number of years and they had to have evaluation reports previously. Don't have to do that uh, anymore. We just look for the listing of these products and make sure they're installed properly and we're good to go. Another fun one, we're in the damper criteria. Uh, we get that certainly when you have dampers, they have to be maintained. Uh, somebody has to go in and look to see if they need to be maintained. And so we now have this approved means of access uh, criteria called out in the code. Specifically, if there are more mechanical types of systems, you know, fusible links or other internal operators, then we get into at least the minimum size of these uh, access areas. Um, and we need to make sure, I love this because we're getting more signs every cycle. We have to have these, these access doorways, ports, whatever you want to call them, uh, labeled uh, with the type of damper that they are. So fire damper, smoke damper, combination fire, whatever, it's going to have to show up on the, uh, that, that little doorway, that little removable uh, segment. Uh, so that we know what's behind there. It doesn't give us any sort of criteria related to uh, when you see labeling, I always say it's signage. I would not impose the accessibility criteria for tactile and braille on this. Uh, this is intended for maintenance personnel and it really is requiring them mostly to be able to get up into these areas. And uh, yeah, it, it really is not intended for that. But for the most part, we do now have uh, these areas where we can get in and we can fix, if you will, and check on these dampers. This is a funny one. It, it, it really has surprised me. I did not realize there was an issue with this. Uh, combustible lockers uh, in break rooms and locker rooms and, and whatnot, that kind of a thing. They are considered to be having uh, an interior finish or at least the interior finish criteria is applied to them. Uh, that's great. Again, I, I haven't seen a situation where we have maybe a, a class A or B fire resistance rating required per se, but we have that. And so I suppose during plan review and during inspection, if you see these combustible lockers going into whatever area it is, it could be an employee passageway, I'm not sure, whatever else uh, is out there that people are going to use these, these lockers. It gives no area. Presumably, if there's one locker, uh, then it would apply as opposed to 100 lockers or whatever. It doesn't say. So we have to consider them as having uh, the requirement for interior finish for that particular space. There is an exception, obviously, if the, the space only has to meet Class C, uh, we, we don't have to worry about that so much. Class C does, I would think, in at least the areas that I've been able to dream up, apply in most of those cases. Uh, but supposedly, there may be areas where uh, there's a higher classification. Okay, great. Once that happens, then we have to apply Chapter 8 to these combustible lockers, and then we're good to go. Just got to remember this during plan review and inspection, yet another thing that we have to pick up on. Okay, moving on into chapter nine, you can see in this particular case, we have fire sprinkler uh, requirements. Again, uh, as we talked about earlier in this webinar, uh, for distilled spirits manufacture or wine storage, we have the consideration for them. 
Now, the interesting thing is if you have uh, a place where they are uh, distilling the actual spirits, uh, it's an F1 occupancy. We saw that before. Sprinklers are required, period. It doesn't matter what the area is of that distilled sprinkler, a uh, sprinkler, spirit uh, manufacturing area where you're creating the distilled spirits. It could be 100 feet. It could be 10,000 feet. doesn't matter. Sprinklers are required. And the same is true for the storage of these uh, distilled spirits or wine storage bulk store wine bulk storage i think is what it's supposed to say but anyway there's no area limit so anytime you are storing wine in bulk then we've got sprinklers required right okay it's going to be interesting to see how this gets applied moving out i would imagine in most cases you know if they're if they're actually creating the distilled spirits they have a uh, a good size area it's not just some sort of accessory or other type of use that is not the primary use. And so, yeah, we get that there could be sprinkler requirements uh, imposed, but uh, we get into some areas when there are no, or some issues, some projects where there are no area limits and it raises some questions, certainly in my mind. Uh, what if somebody just off to the side on their own, is they have an air still or whatever, is creating their own, it would have to be sprinklered. Uh, interesting thing about that is I actually have an air still. I can, if I desire, create, uh, go through and create the mash, create, you know, whatever distilled spirit. Uh, would that cause my garage to be an F1 occupancy and then have to be sprinklered and, and all of that? Uh, probably not. Uh, we have other more hazardous materials, I think, stored in our garages than just that. So, um, but in, in, anyway, uh, being the code geek that I am, uh, I, I come up with those sorts of situations and wonder what to do with them moving out in the future. But we have them now and we have the protection that's required for them. Open parking garages, 48,000 square feet, the fire area of these. We now get sprinklers in open parking garages. We had an allowance for them because of the ventilation. We you know didn't have as much concern back in the day we have seen certainly problems uh fires in open parking garages and how do you uh actually control them suppress them uh that kind of a thing if there's no sprinkler system very difficult uh, i'm not a firefighter myself but i can't imagine having to try to get my apparatus up into the open parking garage to the third level perhaps and then to address uh what is under fire uh, we have had certainly issues with particular vehicles catching on fire. And so we want to make sure that uh, while water doesn't necessarily control all that well, uh, the fire that is potentially raging within the electric vehicle, but it, it can protect the areas that are surrounding it. And so we do have the criteria now that requires the automatic sprinkler installation in these open parking garages. Mechanical access parking garages. These these popped up for a while and they were moving along pretty pretty well. And I haven't seen too many projects here lately, but we have some challenges with um, these systems because they are a system. It is basically a, an automated type of a system where it's not basically it is an automated type of a system where you just take your vehicle uh, and park it either at the front or perhaps they allow you to drive in. I can't imagine that they would do that. We probably would have some trained uh, personnel there on site that would actually drive it into or onto uh, the lift area itself and then move it to whatever space that it's going to reside. Well, the challenge we have with these is that if there is a problem with a vehicle, presumably it's a vehicle, that's all they should be storing, it could be the system itself, that if the sprinkler system is only installed in the building, if you will, the enclosure of this mechanical access parking garage, that the fire could be shielded by the vehicles that are being stored there. And so the building itself that these mechanical parking garages uh, reside in, the, the entire building has to be fully sprinklered, and the mechanical access garage unit, if you will, or system 
has to have a specially engineered system, and that is the term that is used. Uh, there's other criteria. There's control room. There's uh, smoke removal. There's other things that can be uh, in, that are imposed actually uh, by this. But these are the in, these are the biggies right here. We want to make sure that the hazards associated with these vehicles are addressed by this active fire suppression system. Okay. I don't know what kind of specially engineered system they've got out there these days uh, for these, uh, these uh, automated types of garage settings, but uh, presumably they're gonna have to be throughout the structure, I would expect, so that uh, they can get to any problem that potentially is underneath a vehicle or in the vehicle or whatnot. So we've got that now. I, I envision there's gonna be more work on this moving out into the future uh, as we get a little more experience with these systems themselves. There's definitions that have been added and other things too uh, in the code related to these uh, automated parking garages. This is a fun one. And actually, I think the next one is fun too. Okay, we had for residential, uh, types of settings, occupancies, a requirement for sprinklers. We get that. I think that occurred in the 2012 edition of the IBC. May have been the 2009. Uh, they all kind of blend together, but it was somewhere in that time frame. I think it was the 2012. And we have uh, the allowance for residential occupancies to use the residential NFPA sprinkler criteria. Well, we had to go to the NFPA 13 to find out what that is. And so what they've done is they've brought in, if you will, kind of, for lack of a better term, the scoping of the NFPA 13 R requirements into the code. So we have this now. So if you have a group R occupancy and they want to, you know, obviously they have to have an automated fire sprinkler installed, to be able to use a 13R criteria has, has to meet all of the, these conditions, four or, four, it should say four stories or less, four or fewer stories, whatever, that's in the code. The highest floor level is 30 feet or less above the lowest level of fire department access, so they can get apparatus to a reasonable uh, location to address the fire. And the lowest floor, it's actually a similar type of uh, criteria is two, is 30 feet or less below the lowest level of fire department access. So 30 feet above or 30 feet below is the, the concern for uh, the vert verticality, if you will, of these, to be able to use 13R systems. It's like, okay, that's great. So if you don't meet one of these, what do you do? Well, you have to use a full 13 system. You have to deal with the material and the location and the, you know, the the all the criteria related to a full 13 setting that is required uh, by that particular standard for that particular building, that residential building you've got there. Okay, but we now have this, if you will, scoping of the 13 R criteria in the building code itself. You don't have to go to the NFPA 13 makes it certainly a lot easier for the uh, building officials and fire code officials that have to enforce this to understand what system uh, can be or is required to be applied to these residential occupancies. All right, we now have, uh, based on this particular uh, code change, we now have amendments to NFPA 13R. Okay, we want to have certain areas uh, more areas really protected by these fire sprinkler systems. And so you can see the open-ended corridors is the one that was existing, but you can see these areas that are now uh, required to have sprinklers, even if 13R allows them to be exempt. Uh, self-storage fire alarm systems, we've got uh, these larger self-storage, you can see three or more stories in height. We're gonna have fire alarm systems installed, uh, visible notification, is not required within each individual uh, storage unit. I think uh, most of the mostly these are unoccupied, but that what that says is that you'll have to have the 
the visible notification in the corridors or the hallways really that serve those. And we have a criteria that allows for uh, a little bit of a, um, a different way of designing smoke proof enclosures. There's a new method of pressurizing these stairway enclosures and all of that. Very detailed type of a system, uh, which is very handy. Uh, gives us a little more flexibility than to rely necessarily on some fire protection engineers uh, report, which most are fine, but uh, we'll, we will have this and we can use this to compare uh, our criteria against that. Fire command centers. Uh, there's a requirement for fire command centers in our uh, moderate hazard factory and storage occupancies when you've got a uh, half a million square feet or greater. Uh, basically, if you go to the third bullet, the fire uh, code official is going to make the determination about the location, presumably the size, even though there's a minimum size and all that, uh, and what needs to be going on within that command center itself. Unoccupied mechanical rooms, uh, we're going to skip. Uh, this is where we're going to end. Uh, at this time, I would like to uh, open it up for any questions that you may have. And with that, thank you very much. All right. Well, thank you, Paul, and thank you uh, to all of our attendees for joining us today. We've got a big crowd today. So we've had quite a few questions come in, so I'm just going to jump on a few. I, I would like to uh, just say that I do realize that I use the California version of uh, the heights and areas tables. Uh, I apologize for that. I am based in California. That's the bulk of my experience, so it, it slipped my mind. And going through that, we will change that in the future. If that is a question anybody comes up with, yeah, we did have a couple questions on uh, on some of the numbering, so not a problem. We'll get that updated in our handout when we have uh, this as an e-course on our website. So if anybody has any questions on that, uh, that that's our why there would be a difference. But Paul, you know, don't worry about it. Typically, I'm guilty of the, the East Coast bias, so it's nice once in a while to have a little West Coast bias uh, in there some of go. our presentations. So um, first question we have here uh, is re related to penthouses. Uh, if you have an occupied, I, and I think you may have talked about this a little bit, but I, I know I may have missed part of it because I was answering questions. So uh, if you have an occupied rooftop structure, what would be the delineation on that being considered a separate story? Well, effectively, it's very limited uh, when you get to that point. Occupied roofs, uh, in many cases, uh, will just be decks, but there are hotels that want to have pools, and then some people talk about putting bars out there, and when you have other types of convenience areas, such as bars or maybe food service or whatnot, then you're going to potentially have uh, structures that would cause us to reevaluate the roof height and maybe even the area of the building based on that. And so uh, the penthouse definition is still fairly limited, um, and we, we cannot at this point uh, allow for anything else uh, up there, bathrooms, uh, enclosed storage for uh, maybe a pool deck or something along those lines to occur without us having to reevaluate the building. People are looking at that, though. Right. Absolutely. Had a few questions come in on uh, the play structures, actually. Um, when we talk about that 600 square foot li limit for play structures, how do we calculate that? Is that based on the square, uh, like the, the footprint of the, um, of the structure? Is it based on if it has multiple stories? Great question. Uh, that is something that is not clearly defined in the code as to how you define what the play structure is uh, and then determine whether or not the area meets or exceeds uh, the requirement in the code. That has to be done by the local building official or maybe fire official. Uh, my opinion, my opinion only, uh, because the code again doesn't say, uh, is that I would look primarily at the footprint of the structure itself 
and then if the structure does have uh, areas that are enclosed or bounded by, or that are enclosing or bounding a small area that is used as part of the play activities, for lack of a better term, I would probably end up looking at that too. But again, uh, as I said uh, in the presentation, uh, once you make that determination, try to uh, uh, keep that and then apply that consistently throughout your jurisdiction. All right, that's a great answer. Thank you, Paul. All right, we're getting close to the half hour here, so I'll ask just one more question and then we'll give it back to Marcy to do our closing announcements. Uh, here's a, a good question. Uh, I think it was slide 15, you talked about distilling or brewing um, and it talks about being in accordance with the IFC. Is there a specific section of the IFC we need to look at? Ah, uh, that's a great question. I would ha I don't have that off the top of my head. I did note that it did say the CFC. Uh, again, my California bias. Sorry, uh, Not a I will change that. Uh, moving out on that particular slide, but uh, there is criteria in the fire code that we need to evaluate. Uh, and take a look at. So uh, if you want, please feel free to email me and I will get you that particular reference. All right, wonderful. Well, Paul, thank you again so much. This was a really great webinar. I know a lot of our attendees have expressed those sentiments at well as well. So thank you to our attendees. We really appreciate you joining us and I'll go ahead and give it back to Marcy for our closing announcements here. Thank you very much. Take care, everybody. This concludes the American Institute of Architects for Continuing Education Systems course.